Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you for extending me and uh, the Bear Life Review uh, this opportunity for us to debut. Uh, it's quite befitting. Uh, the topic of today, tonight's conversation is it kind of evokes the themes uh, the journal is all about. So thank you for that uh, to Litquig and the San Francisco Public Library. I'm also very grateful and I feel quite privileged uh, to share stage with uh, these amazing writers. And I hope that tonight, uh, if anything, uh, will be diverting. Uh, I know we live in a very dark time in which humor um, is uh, a very expensive thing uh, to find. So tonight, at the very least, we should uh, have a bit of irony, something <laughs> that, uh, yeah, that we can laugh about, you know? So, so I will begin, uh, of course, the, you know, the, the title of the talk, uh, Immigrant Writers Response to Trump, uh, itself is, it entails a lot of things that are not subtle, uh, questions and problems. Namely, immigrant writer, what is that? Um, namely, what is the role of the immigrant writer? But also, what is an immigrant writer? Mm. Uh, the lumping of the two words, which have histories um, that are com complicated. Um, the conflation of that hyphen is not easy. Uh, so I will begin this conversation with a tackling of that particular designation. Uh, so what is an immigrant writer? But more specifically, what is the role, uh, if there is one, of an immigrant writer? Uh, what does that entail? Uh, so you guys, by all means, enlighten us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to just bring up something that I thought about on the way over here. Um, Nabokov was an immigrant writer, but nobody called him that. Right. That was never a, a um, definition of who he was in the public sphere. He was always in exile, which we all are in one form or another. But that has now shifted to becoming the immigrant writer. And... Thinking about Nabokov, I thought about the ways in which his Russianness um, and his living in America um, all served one thing, which was that he was a writer. And I feel like in today's atmosphere, we are immigrants first mm -hmm. in the public eye. How we consider ourselves varies, but how we are seen is immigrant first and then writer. And I am annoyed by that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm struck by a statistic that I just looked up today, which is that uh, between first generation and second generation immigrants, we have about 26% of our population. And that's a pretty significant percentage. It's, it's actually not one I had looked up before. Um, for myself, I'm first generation. I was born in Iran, uh, but mostly raised here. Uh, but some of my family members are second generation, so we have a wide range in our family. Um, but given that we're such a significant percentage of this country, uh, we're a minority, but we're a pretty fat one. <laughs> uh, um, I don't think there should be a singular role for whatever the role of an immigrant writer is, because I, I'm all for the freedom of the imagination. Um, I think it's kind of sad that this ombre is making bad ombres out of us because we shouldn't be f sort of put into a basket of whatever, what is that expression, whatever, deplorables, whatever. Um, because I think what, what happened is you're, you're basically being politicized into responding to Trump but you know, as a writer who came from Vietnam, who lost a country, who was a refugee and not even an immigrant, but someone who fled, mm -hmm. um, I have dealt with this issue of being migratory, someone who crossed borders, someone who watched the, the plight of refugees being treated badly mm -hmm. long before Trump comes to mm -hmm. power. So for me, the fight had been long and hard mm -hmm. and challenging. And so I refused to let this man dictate what my imagination mm -hmm. tells me. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, I will respond to what at core is beating in my heart, mm -hmm. you know, and translate into something that is aesthetically 
comprehensible for the rest of the world. And if that is my form of resistance, so be it. But I will not let him dictate my voice. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, uh, but there is um, the, uh, there's an issue, namely that you are called to respond as an immigrant, right? Um, and I think I don't think the the title of the talk is inappropriate. Uh, notwithstanding our different reservations as artists, as writers, the truth is historically, uh, maybe the postmodern has kind of uh, you know rendered that particular dispensation of the writer irrelevant. But the author has always uh, been the, cart the person or the voice which categorizes right, uh, the conscience of the community. So it has, has a moral dimension, not just a creative one. And especially as a community that is attacked, right, that is uh, relegated to this state of precarity, right, where if you leave the country, even if you have a green card, you might not come back. Mm -hmm. Even if you're born here and you happen to be, to belong to one of those bad groups that uh, the president uh, you know, wants to banish from the country, you are troubled. And so the role of writing is no longer innocent. And so the writer is no longer a free agent who can you know, pursue the stuff of the imagination. There's a radical call for you. And especially given that we're here, right? I mean, not every immigrant uh, gets to come and sit here and talk about these issues. Mm -hmm. The very gesture that has been extended to us to be here has ethical and obliga obligatory dimension. Namely, how do we make use of this space as writers that are called immigrant writers to kind of evoke the plight of our community, right? Whatever that is. And that I think can compromise your creative uh, freedom. But I think is a part that is critical at least so, so there's no really dodging the question of the immigrant writer, <laughs> right? <laughs> we, must, we must account for the immigrant in the designation. Yes. As an immigrant, not as a writer I mean, as well, yeah. I don't know what you guys think, but when I think of myself, which is rarely, yeah. um, <laughs> selfless as I am, um, I'm a mother of two very small children, so I have yeah. no choice, but um, <clears throat> the way that I like to think of myself is as a storyteller. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And there is no dodging of the moral and ethical yeah. ramifications of our having a public voice. Yeah. Like you said, not all immigrants are sitting up here on the mm -hmm. panel. Mm -hmm. And so when I whittle it down to the essence of storytelling, mm -hmm. then I begin to see my responsibilities clearly. Like Walter Benjamin said, you know, the storyteller is responsible for bringing the wisdom. Mm -hmm. So to be a storyteller in this particular moment in history, in this particular geographical place, is to go against the news. Mm. Because the news is this crazy noise that is filling all of the space, and it is without wisdom, mm -hmm. completely without poetry, mm -hmm. completely without wisdom. It is now increasingly without truth yeah. and fact. Mm -hmm. And so the writer has to go in, and the storyteller has to harness all of those energies and bring them in, in the simplest, most entertaining form, mm. in a way that kind of crosses all of these designations. Because I am not writing a story, for, no offense, for Anita to read. Mm -hmm. Because Anita and I have <laughs> very similar, not super similar, but somewhat similar lives, you know, more similar than me and the person next to me on the bus. I'm writing a story for the person next to me on the bus to have that connection. Mm. And so Trump or no Trump, I will say his name, um, At your own peril. Yes, I know. Oh. Though my Google Home device has already recorded many damning things that I have said against the administration. Um, so this notion of having to tell the story to get as many ears as possible to sort of bring as much wisdom as I can get into the conversation is what I kind of wake up to go to work for every day. Because the hysteria is not serving anybody. No, no, like if you think about previous hyphenated writers, you know, civil rights activist writers or um, anti-apartheid writers, like it was the storytelling mm -hmm. that pushed those things through the mess. James Baldwin, for example. Um, so I don't know, I kind of, I try to go into that instead of engaging in the call and response of Twitter or the kind of constant ugliness that takes place every time Trump himself tweets. 
adding to that, I'll say that for me, it has meant an investigation and an elongation of my hyphen. <laughs> In other words, uh, I've called myself an Iranian-American writer, but now I'm also thinking of myself as an Iranian-Lithuanian-American writer. And there's a reason for that, actually, which is that my writing investigation has gone back into my Lithuanian family and the fact that they were uh, refugees to this country at the end of World War II. So actually, after Trump announced the Muslim ban, what I did, oddly enough, perhaps, is I got in my car and I drove to the Richmond shipyards. <laughs> uh, most of you will probably know that at the shipyards, the uh, Victory ships and the Liberty ships were built that were used in World War II. And there's one ship left called the Red Oak Victory, which people can tour. So I went on a tour of this ship alone in the middle of the day, the only person there, because it was precisely a ship like that that carried my refugee family from uh, Germany to New Orleans at the end of World War II, actually five years after World War II. And so in terms of the role of the immigrant writer, uh, I can only speak for myself on this topic, but for me what it's pushed is an investigation of things like not just my own family, but refugee policy, what it was like then, and of course, what it's like now. So just a quick figure that may be of interest, at that time, 400,000 refugees were permitted into the United States as part of the Displaced Persons Act, which was pushed by Harry Truman and really celebrated him. He basically said, I think this is gonna be great for our country. Uh, compared to what we have now, which is we have, what, 100,000 refugees permitted under Obama, and now they're estimating about 60,000 will be let into this country uh, under the current administration this year. So what I see and what I am writing about and, and feeling deeply is a real diminishment of our, uh, our generosity towards others in situations particularly of war and destitution and misery. And, um, and so what I'm hoping to do, at least with this essay and with my thinking about the past and the present, is use this as an opportunity to, for, to think about and hopefully for others to think about as well, how, what do we want to be as a people? And are we able to be generous in the way that we used to as be? As American, you mean? As Americans. Well, um, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about my own biography, which I wrote about in my first book, and, um, and how much of the uh, generosity of America at the end of the Vietnam War allowed this massive population of Vietnamese to come in. Mm -hmm. And I've written about issues of comparing Vietnamese, say, compared to Syrian refugees who now perish at sea and get very little attention, or you know the same kind of largesse that my population, my people did um, 40 years ago. Um, but my, the battle that I've been fighting had been always been this idea of ex inclusivity at the uh, time when uh, you're ignored and misunderstood. So the space had always been over um, what define an American, mm -hmm. I think. And the, don't, Trump is not new, but what he is is he's intensified this idea of this monolithic Americanness. Make America great again is really subtext for making America white again. I mean, that's kind of understood without m much, you know, uh, research. It's just understood because that's his keyword to his constituents. Um, so there is this idea that is the identity of the American person has been shrinking. Mm. But the reality is that we are becoming more complicated all the time. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I want to point out that, that while on the political level there is this contraction of that identity, but on the cultural level, we're expanding. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> If, you, if you're pessimistic looking at this kind of political power, mm -hmm. you're missing the other dynamic which is called cultural everyday life. Mm -hmm. And I can just name a, a, just like personal friends of mine who've made incredible um, uh, inroad into a, a American letters. I mean, uh, Viet Nguyen won the Pulitzer, he and I went to Berkeley together. Mm -hmm. um, Ocean Vuong won the Wit, uh, what, what is that big award, poetry award? Um, another friend of mine, she's a Hmong, and she won the Whitman Award. Three friends of mine who are Cambodian and Chinese and uh, 
Vietnamese, mm -hmm. you know, made award-winning um, films. Um, so it's, if we just look at this political structure that is claiming to define who we are, of course it feels very pessimistic. Mm -hmm. But if you look on the cultural level, in fact we become even more complicated mm -hmm. than that narrative is telling us. Mm -hmm. And that's where the strength of literature really lies, is to point out that no, these hyphens are not just between you know, Iranian and, mm -hmm. and America, but hyphen between uh, Lithuanian, American, you know, Persian, and probably a lot more. Yeah. And that pluralism is a reality, not a political idea. Mm -hmm. it's, it's everyday life lived. Just this morning, someone sent me an article how Vietnamese sandwich now is like the number one sandwich in the U.S., the banh mi. <laughs> and, and he was so proud. And I, I had to point out to him that, you know, 80% of that is borrowed by our colonizer, the French. Right. Right. You know, and we just add cilantro and some chili sauce in it. Uh, but, but we made it ours, right? Yeah. But, um, but whatever, it is, it, it's both yours and mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing about culture is that it crosses border without having trying so hard. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you think on the political level, suddenly you're Republican and I'm Democrat. And I think the role of literature, at least in some part, is to sort of show the complexity of that greatness yeah. in between. Mm -hmm. And if it's very successful, you come out and say, all right, an immigrant is also me. You know, I'm not the, he's not the other. Part of him is me. I'm eating his sandwich right now, right? <laughs> That's the room humor for you. Yeah, I, I agree, and, and I really admire your optimism. Um, I feel my role obliges me to push back, <laughs> which may underscore a pessimistic strain in me. Uh, but I want to push back a little bit farther, because even though America, you know, it's, you're right, the cultural landscape or dynamic, it's almost indifferent uh, to all the political kind of... Uh, limitations that I impose, you know, by calling you what or that. But there is this fact, uh, this infinite proliferation of hyphens, you know, right. you're Lithuanian, Iranian, American. Why the need for that then, right? What kind of calculus necessitates that you, and it's not just for everybody, right? I think the Lithuanian in your family doesn't have to declare I'm a Lithuanian American. They're just American because they're white. And even make America great again, which is say make America white again, it's kind of like, like a misnomer because America's still white very much in a way that matters, right? So why the need for hyphens? Why the need for these, you know, every day there's a new dispensation. As a black person, it was the N-word, it was slave, now it was African-American, now it's black. It, 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 it keeps changing. So the logic of designation, namely of exclusion, persist, right? And no matter how the Milton pot uh, occasion a sense of universal relevance, there is that special place to which you are relegated. And that is something that we need to, to think about. But let's move away from that, because I want to talk about. <laughs> let's. No, 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 no. That's I want not to talk fair. about. No, no. You can't no, as just a writer, say that okay. and no, not no, no. let us respond. You can respond to that too. But like, as somebody, <laughs> like, okay, uh, like, as writers, right, we do this. <clears throat> however hard, even soundly, mm. however strong my argument for a claim to universal kind of citizenship in the Republic of Letters, I will always be a Sudanese writer. Mm. If that fails, an African writer. If that fails, a black writer, <laughs> right? <laughs> that will always haunt my work, Yeah. right? And that we can look at it from the force which necessitates this designation, but also what does that do for me as a writer whose work will always be seen through the lens of as another? What does that do for how I deploy, use, or appeal, even imaginatively to my past, as Sudanese, as African, as black? And is there an ethical consideration in how we write about, our, about those communities, even especially imaginatively? Because I think the imagination is given too much license sometimes that it doesn't account for the responsibility of writing about those communities. So you are, your fiction is historical sometimes, mm -hmm. and it's read by mostly Americans, I would assume, maybe Iranians too. So as you explore that material and try to fashion it into a relevant kind of uh, engagement, like, 
do you feel a little strange or do you question your right to invoke or evoke that history? Especially when it's gonna be published in a place in which you're always gonna be the Iranian American and how it's gonna be kind of consumed and subsumed and made use of. Do I question my right to engage with the material or I do, I'm not going oh, to is, question. Is the material yours just by virtue of you coming from there? Hmm. Now that you're writing as an Iranian American slash Lithuanian American, right? That's a question. Tricky. Tricky question. <laughs> so uh, maybe it will help to give a little context because uh, as, as many people know, since uh, the mm. Iran and the United States have had this complicated and difficult relationship for decades, I'm a person who has come of age during that process. So I had the opportunity to be in Iran before the Islamic Revolution and to spend about six months there during that period, and then also to witness it after the revolution, and of course, to see the changes in the relationship that took place between the United States and, and Iran as a result. And those changes um, resulted in a lot of political ill will for reasons you, many of you know, of course. So for me, as a writer dealing with historical material, uh, I see it not just as being about that topic, those topics that I chose to engage with in the novels, but also about uh, engaging with that complicated relationship between the US and Iran, uh, and which unfortunately continues to uh, not be good. And, uh, and so, so it's, a, it's a longer, for me, it's been a long conversation about how to grapple with those political problems, but to do it in the context of a novel and to do it in the context of trying to uh, discuss and describe aspects of the Iranian experience that I felt were being overlooked by a media that was focused primarily on uh, the negative, basically, about Iran. And the problem when you come from a country that has been essentially blacklisted by the United States is that people stop going there, and so there stop being relationships with the other country. There stop being marriages and student exchanges and business deals. There stop being the sense of humanity of the people in that other place. And so I feel like my work has been about bringing that humanity to the to the fore for my readers. Uh, by the way, the book is published in 31 languages now, so my readers are Americans, but they're also all those other languages as well. And, uh, and, and trying to, to grapple with the dilemmas of being Iranian in this age. Mm -hmm. Lala, do you have a comment? Do you want to rephrase that yeah. Yeah. question one more time it's, to me so I can get angry it's just again? A kind of, it's, <laughs> I suppose. I suppose my Go question ahead. is um, the ease of continuity of the past once you enter the United States and you become... Oh, what right do I have? Right. Well, I guess you do have a right, but also... Oh, thank you. Um, you did a nice job of being kind. Uh, okay, so it is completely my right, because as, as you have decided for yourself that you are South Sudanese and then African and then black... It's more like imposed, but... I have well, no choice. <laughs> there you go. If you said at the very end that it will be black. Is that these are my inheritances. My, as a writer, you want to go to the deepest well mm -hmm. to begin. Mm -hmm. If you go to the shallow wells, your work is not going to resonate. Mm -hmm. And so when I sat with myself at 26 or whatever it was, dropping out of med school and filmmaking and however I came to writing, I wanted to go to the deepest well. And my American self mm. was not a deep well. Mm. Partially because I wasn't born here and I came here at five. And also partially because the Americans did not give me mm. in their history mm. a place for myself. I am part of the jet age migration. I am not part of the Ellis Island steamboat migration. I am not part of the Chinese who were brought here to work as slaves. I am not part of the Africans. I am part of this newer migration that had no history to it, except for what my family carried around with them in their stories and their food, et cetera, et cetera. And so I went further because I could not write from that. It was yeah. not enough. And so I went back as far as I possibly could to which I have access to, to which I have the right. And I did not get everything correct I still have Kurdish people from Turkey and Syria and Iran and Iraq writing me emails <laughs> telling me that in my first book, my 
presentation of the family living in this small village was totally wrong, and the father would have sat here, and the mother would, and I'm like, okay, so I did not get that. That's nice. But, <laughs> you feel vindicated, don't you? But, <laughs> but I was gonna write it anyway, because right. note, I write fiction. Right. So get out of my way. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like I am not a nonfiction writer and I'm not a journalist and this yeah. will come from some hodgepodge of mythology mm. and inheritance and dreams and imagination and that will make the book. But what it is yeah. as a hyphen, yes. hyphenated person is it is my announcing of presence of self mm. among you. So hyphen or not, this book will sit in this house and it will go into a stranger's hands and it will do the work that I cannot do mm -hmm. when I meet you at the grocery store. And I will not meet the person who reads it, most likely, but then that will be a small chink mm -hmm. in the news narrative, in this terrible vilifying that happens. Fiction will do the work of wisdom mm -hmm. and whether or not I got it completely factually, culturally right, writing you know, 1919 in Kermanshaw or not, I'm not too concerned with. Yeah. You know, my calling was to bring the past forward, make a story relatable, and now that I've started writing the present, and it is engaged the hyphen, yeah. as my character is Iranian American, mm -hmm. and trying very hard to be just American, in interviews and in conversations, largely white journalists and reviewers have always been like, why aren't the white people better represented in this story? <laughs> That's interesting. And I'm like, great, nice this question. is a conversation. Yeah. I think this is where we want to start talking. Yeah. Like, yeah. you're willing to engage with a possible uglier side of yourselves. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, let's talk, like, because of this and this and this, you know? But yeah, I think that the, we can go as far back as we want and claim right. it as fiction writers. We are all fiction writers and nonfiction. Well, I, 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 I write mean, the question both, is harder, so. but I want to give a context a bit to. Right. Because even in nonfiction, right, there is, I like this about writing because it's still writing and because the fact is real in the world when it's on the page, the, the kind of like reproduction of it is a totally different process and a, a, a creation really. And I like how you talk in your book about how when you sp speak in English, there's a kind of liberation. Right. right. Mm. You un unburdened, uh, you're kind of uh, freed from all of these like strings of history and sure. past and the traumas that attend them uh, to really be funny and be cute and savvy. And you talk a little bit about how in school we were just, you know, with Chinese girls and Vietnamese yeah. girls, with this handsome, funny, witty guy when you spoke English. Thank you for that interpretation. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> but, but talk about that, but also respond to this because you're yes. writing nonfiction. So, so I, I write both nonfiction and fiction. So therefore, I, I, I think there is a problem with um, yeah. authenticity in, in nonfiction because you get fact-checked for mm -hmm. one thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's problematic, especially write for a magazine. Mm -hmm. I get fact-checked all the time and it gets really complicated. Yeah. So in that sense, you have to be historically accurate. But regardless, you can choose, you know, as a writer and as someone who fled from a country where you're, you're not allowed to think freely, mm -hmm. I think um, I really am for the idea that you can choose any topic you want, mm -hmm. any theme you want, and certainly any character you mm -hmm. want. Mm -hmm. Just because you're from a, another place, that doesn't mean that should be your topic by de facto. Right. You know, it should be that if you're into NASA and traveling to Mars, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you're from Iran or Vietnam. You should be able to write about Mars. You know what I mean? It will be slightly harder to get published. Yes. So that's a <laughs> right. I agree, but that's a yeah. different topic. <laughs> yeah, you know? Um, yeah. On the other hand, yeah. this whole idea of immigration and immigrant writers, especially if we talk about immigration, um, it, it comes to pass that we have to bring our past with us. Mm -hmm. Because for, when you talk about the piece, when I wrote in, in uh, Perfume Dreams, mm -hmm. when speaking English, it liberated me, but it only liberated me only so long before I ran into a wall in which the English language didn't reach back to the war, to my childhood, to the trauma and beauty of that world in which I had felt like a dream mm. and faded away because I had become an American. Mm. And until I put the written language, not the spoken language, yeah. but the written language to cross back to over the Pacific Ocean to reach back to that Vietnamese kid, yeah. I wasn't free either. Mm. And so for me, it wasn't just about fighting 
you know, in the space of imagination, so the American knew who I am, but also for myself to actually say, I'm this and that. Mm -hmm. And you know, this hyphen is going to stretch really far, <laughs> you know, as if I'm going to reach toward myself, mm -hmm. you know, and that self is complicated because it's constantly changing, mm -hmm. but it also has to acknowledge its past, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it wasn't a ball wind that say who can, who, which of us escape, can escape, oh my God, I'm going to terribly paraphrasing it, <laughs> the past and who, you know, how the past is wrapped up in you yeah. anyway. So, you know, if you cannot escape the past, yeah. then make a good story out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know who said that. Is it Kennedy or Chiron who said that the exiled is either a poet or a novelist? Because that's what you have to do, especially <laughs> because you inhabit this friction. Yeah. And, and you can be either that as a way to kind of... Uh, if you are so well disposed to kind of bridge the gap, or if you're a little bit of a naughty-minded person, <laughs> just, you know, even widen it mm -hmm. yeah, by sheer insistence of the impossibility of reconciliation. Yeah, there's, there are more questions that I want to ask, but we're running out of time. One of them is, we don't have to answer it, but it's really, like, the, the, the really extreme eloquence of the non-native speaker, which we have displayed here, uh, American don't speak English that well, and you guys, no, it's true, it's true, it's true. I'm an editor, I know this. <laughs> I read their manuscript all the time. And, but, but the eloquence, because it's something that I think I think about a lot, the eloquence of the non-native speaker, which comes from this conscious effort hmm. to master right. the language and the problems that attend that, right? But we're not gonna do that. Uh, we're going to, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going to open the, the space for the <laughs> audience to ask questions and, um, All of us or me? Oh, that's so hard. <laughs> that's a hard question. One book? Or the one I'm thinking about right now? You're moderating, so you can <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Thank you. I like that. Start with you. Oh. Um. Gosh. <laughs> I do not know. I mean, um, when I have a hard time writing, and I feel very stuck. There are a couple of things that I go back to over and over again. One of them is As I Lay Dying mm. by Faulkner. Wow. Um, because he takes such great liberties as a native speaker to really master the language. <laughs> and um, I go back to the stories of Scheherazade uh, just because I am constantly needing to be reminded that writing is a seduction. And I have to seduce my reader. And I often go back, interestingly, <clears throat> because I write in English and not in Farsi, to the Bible, which is the beginning of all musical English. Mm. Um, so the Old Testament, you know, the first 300 pages, I can't read beyond that. But <laughs> those are the texts. Moby Dick is on my mind. Wow. Which may seem funny because I get really seasick. <laughs> I don't sail or anything. It's a total macho book because it's only about guys. I don't think there's a single female character in there except maybe a barmaid or something. Uh, but it's the craft of it mm -hmm. that I really admire. Um, not just the fact that he somehow gets away with talking for 10 pages about whale line and you read it, mm -hmm. but that the way he deploys the plot and the characters is so incredibly um, full of technique. I think that book can be studied really fruitfully for, uh, for how to write a novel uh, and the ending, which I would love to mention here, but I won't because you may not have read it, but it's brilliant. It's brilliant the way it ends. So, uh, you know, it's really hard for me to pick one book yeah. because I just, but, but I will say that I love particularly the big fat 19th century novels. <laughs> um, hmm. I, I have so many favorite and they come and go, but I think if I, I think out loud right now, would be um, Love in the Time of Cholera. Oh, um, and it has nothing to do with my kind of writing, but when I read Marquez's work, um, especially that book, I get lost in, in the world of, of, of description, of sensuality, of the beauty of poetry. Um, but I think, 
you know, what that book achieved for me at least is, and the kind of books I love are the kind that sort of it has this generous vision of the world in a way that old decrepit couple in the time of cholera falling in love, which is sort of like at the end of their life, mm. you know, and they're fed it and they're old and they probably couldn't get it up anymore. But, uh, <laughs> and yet he, he had turned them into giddy teenager at the end of their life. And that's really hard to do. Mm. And then you, you know, you root for them even as the world fall apart. And, you know, and that kind of vision is hard to do. The same way I would say, say Lolita. Because mm. if you say, what's that book about? It's like this guy who basically raped a little girl. Mm -hmm. And the moment you say that, that's the end of your wanting to read that book because it's like, oh my God, he's a monster. Mm -hmm. And yet literature, what it does, it, it, it confounds you. It makes a monster into a real three-dimensional, well-rounded human being with his delusion, but you know, he thinks he's in love. And by the end of the book, yeah, he should go to jail, but you cannot condemn him because part of his delusion is maybe part of yours, too, about something else. And so then you're kind of like, how can this book do this to me, right? And so I think books that have that ability to force you to see the world from completely different eyes um, make, make the other so much more real than, you know, the, you know, stranger, but someone you actually know, you know? I like some of the books you guys mentioned, Love of Time of Color, the Moby Dick, and the Bible, of course. I'm Catholic, guys, so <laughs> I have a thing for the Bible. <laughs> it's incurable. Um, my favorite books, I'll, the first book I ever read, I think I was 11, and I had just learned Arabic, and it was the only book by an African that I had ever read. And I was steep in Arabic literature, medieval and modern, and so it was always weird. Like I'm either a slave in the show, like in the novels or the poetry, or I, that's it. That's the only presence. Like no, I'm, I'm not that. And so when I read Chebe, of course, it, it mm -hmm. changed everything. So the African trilogy by Chebe is probably my mm. favorite book of all time. Not only because it's just a masterful work of prose, but also his insistence on you know, on kind of evoking the African world or reality, not even African, or the world of his fiction. And it's not, it's not really concerned with um, a response to the West. It's really its own thing. I don't even think it's a realist fiction at all. Mm. Like, it's, it's a myth uh, that he tries to stage to open the door for other African writers. And of course, uh, Toni Morrison, mm. who's another, I think they work together in that kind of strain, at this radical resistance of the white imaginer dictating the terms of mm. creativity or fiction writing. So I like that. And of course, V.S. Napel, yeah. uh, House of Mississippus was, just because it's funny. Yeah. I, mm. I, I just keep laughing and it's so absurd. And of course, he's a master prose writer. Yeah, so that's just books that I'm thinking about right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a long list of nonfiction stuff, philosophical stuff. Yeah. But those are my top three, I would say. So if Trump exiled me, I would take, <laughs> with, I would take those with me. <laughs> those to make a point, yeah. um, I was wondering if you have seen any changes in the way your work has been received uh, with the changes in the way the United States sort of regards itself. I mean, we are so much a multicultural society, but for such a long time, particularly outside of California, mm. there was the standard of the white male writer as the exalted writer, and that seems to be changing somewhat. Um, I think there's much more embrace of writers from different cultures with different things to say, uh, particularly in the last 10 years. And I don't, I'm wondering if that's impacted your work and the reception of your work at all, or you still feel like you're sort of battling down the doors uh, to get recognition. Well, you know, it's interesting because you were saying, you know, you've seen, so many of us are seen as race, this race, and this uh, particular background. Mm. But the moment you're famous, <laughs> that's not true anymore. Mm. Like, for instance, uh, Morrison wouldn't be in the African American studies section, mm. should be in the bestseller section. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if you're less well known, then somehow you're social study. And this is a kind of weird dichotomy that we have in this country where, if you're famous enough, you're not gay or black or Asian, you're famous, mm -hmm. you know? 
and then the rest of us are put in this cubicle of sociology, you know, which to me has always been very strange because in fact, I have read books written by non-Vietnamese because I wanted to know what life is like, you know, in, in the other shoes, in the other life. You know, so I don't think of sociology. I want to live that life. I live, want to experience all those things, you know, whereas sometimes people read my work and they say, now I learned so much about your people. And I'm thinking, well, just me. I wrote about it. It's my people <laughs> didn't write that book, right? So it's just my interpretation of my people. You shouldn't claim to know my people. Want to know my people, go live in San Jose for 10 years, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, that's the problem is that you're certainly representative uh -huh. yeah. because you write about your own experience sometimes. Yeah. But, you, you know, it, it shouldn't be that way. You, you want to live that life that is told through that story. You know, I think I agree with a lot of what you're saying, and I think that, um, I don't think, I think there's a great welcoming for the stories from other places. I think that um, the great success of something like Kite Runner mm -hmm. has really opened the doors for people from all over the world to have a voice in publishing. And I feel like I myself am a um, recipient of this open door policy um, in the books that I write and the ones that do get published. What sort of I feel like I'm working against all of the time is the fact that if I would like to write a story about a mother camping in the Grand Canyon that has nothing to do with being Iranian, yeah. Yeah. that story is not going to get published. You know, and if I want to write a book about a Vietnamese woman who <laughs> happens to live in San Jose, people are going to be like, what is wrong? What has right. happened to her? Like, wait, what are we going to do with this book? Because we yeah. can't match the identity of the writer with the content. Um, and that is aggravating mm -hmm. to the nth degree because I maintain that a white writer, male or female, could do that right. and has done that. And I don't mind, I mean, not that I don't mind the appropriation, but I'm not one of those who like is going to get up and like freak out about it, write whatever you want. But I think that should be true of everybody, mm -hmm. not just the hegemonic powers in the publishing industry. Um, and that just drives me nuts um, on a sort of regular day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've covered it. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So um, considering the title of this conversation, um, do you think the voices of all writers will change in any way? Will they become sweeter? Will they become stronger? Will there be more violence? Or do you think this is just a blip in our political arena which will not have any impact on the creativity of novelists or writers in any form? Uh, I, I think it is not a blip. I think many writers are going to feel the need to respond in one way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned the essay I've been working on previously. I, I'm not normally a nonfiction writer, so, but I felt that it was urgent to try to address this in my own small way just because of the times. And similarly, although I've written two previous historical novels, I'm currently working on a novel set in uh, the past couple of years that is not exactly about what is happening, but where all the characters feel the fear and anxiety of the current era. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, as a novelist, um, what I don't want to do is just write about what's happening now and that's it, because it's not necessarily the most long-term or universal thing to write about. I think what one wants to do often as a novelist is write something that, fe that feels like it could be read mm. far into the future. Uh, but, but for me to capture the feeling of now, which is a feeling of fear and anxiety for immigrants, many immigrants, uh, and for many other people as well, uh, is, is what I want to incorporate into my next work. And so I'm setting something in the present, basically, which is not something that I would have done or what, what mm -hmm. I thought I was going to do, uh, but that I feel, I feel I must do right now. So I, I'm not sure any of us can answer for all right. writers, mm -hmm. but I, I can certainly answer for myself, and I, uh, I feel it's essential right now. Um, I have to say that 
I don't know if this happens to you guys, but this notion of writers responding to Trump, like I can sit up here as a person mm -hmm. and respond to Trump mm -hmm. in my political citizen self. But when it comes to my artistic self, I cannot consciously sit down at my desk <laughs> and write a story against Trump mm -hmm. or against this right. administration or against the situation. My imagination just does not work that way. My creativity does not. And then this last book that I wrote, which is about a young man who um, identifies as American and then radicalizes and joins a fundamentalist organization in the Middle East, um, I had these instances of racism against him. As he was growing up in Southern California, he passed as an American, he changed his name, he had all American friends, and there were these instances of racism. And they were minor, but they were intense. And my publisher, this is before the election in November, wrote back to me and said, you know, some of these are a little unbelievable. And I was like, well, that's ridiculous because these are so gentle and so subtle that, you know, I would have to erase them for them for you to consider them believable. After the election, during the book's revisions, he wrote to me and he said, I would like you, if you could, to intensify the instances of racism <laughs> in the book. And I said some language that I will not repeat here because I am a lady <laughs> and um, I'm a lady right now. <laughs> and... Uh, then I proceeded to leave it as it was, and ever since that conversation, this notion of me as a writer creatively responding to the regime mm -hmm. has been uh, like effectively doused. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't even begin to engage right. in a story fashion with what I am feeling. Maybe because the moment is too heavy and you have to do it from the future mm -hmm. or at a distance. Um, and also because of that exchange. Right. So. I've been, um, you know, teaching some writing workshops um, for graduate student MFA programs, and some of them are young, and they feel like they need to take up the mantle and fight with every last drop of their energy. But they don't. They're they're very scattered because they want to do everything: protest, go now, write this list, and do this play. <laughs> and and I, and and I always have to tell them that what my professor told me years ago was: choose your battle, right? Mm. You, you may have all this anger as a citizen, as a human being, but you need to know what your artistic strength is. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if you're gonna fight 10 different battles, you're gonna lose mm -hmm. probably all of them. Mm -hmm. But if you can focus on your, what your strength is and decide if this is your form of resistance, and in a way it's very hard to measure that resistance because it's not necessarily direct, mm -hmm. but who knows if it's you know, not grow five years from now and has an influence on the way we think of ourselves at yeah. our time. So therefore, uh, don't be overfilled with anxieties. I have to be, be a direct response, unless it's dear Donald Trump as an le open letter or something, right? Uh, that you basically need to find your inner strength see the world as you see it rather than be told what it is mm -hmm. and believe in that vision and build up that vision so that it says something important to you mm -hmm. first and foremost mm -hmm. you know before you can help the world i mean for, for me maybe because um um i take trump very seriously mm -hmm. but also not just trump but what his election has occasioned all over the world very seriously creatively speaking uh it's also freeing in a different way, but I'm going to get to that. Uh, it's, for me, I'm questioning a lot of things, a lot of formal aspects of a realist novel. Um, when a president like Trump you know, doesn't believe in facts, doesn't believe in, the so -called, in truth or any truth for that matter, except one which serves him, I think that's a problem uh, for a fiction writer. And for me, that means really in technical terms, that the grammar with which uh, we mediate meaning, uh, which connects all of us in the mediation of meaning, has been rendered irrelevant. And so there's an opening, there's a space where we need to kind of uh, manufacture a new way of talking about what is true, because fiction might not deal in facts, but it deal in truth. Mm. All of which I kind of like rendered obsolete right now. And also because I love this country, um, it's the only place in which I have felt a semblance of humanity. Um, I could go to school and go to college and write and tell a story and sit here. And Trump just, even though he's, you know, 
he's transient. His policies are not. Um, he kind of just with just his inarticulate words rendered all of that irrelevance. Like, dude, um, sorry, but the last 10 years were a fluke, yeah. right? And that, that kind of power, even if it's transient, mm. cannot be ignored. And for me, it has an immediate personal debilitating effect, really. Yeah, because I have, you know, my agent and other people pushing for a memoir. But how do you talk about that? Because America has always served a purpose for the likes of me. You know, right. it's a place to which you're escaping. You know, you spend decades in the refugee camps awaiting resettlement uh, to come to a place where you can actually finally, you know. Well, I'll, I'll say something because I think I wrote something similar to this. Uh, <laughs> But it wasn't during Trump administration. It was right after 9-11. Mm -hmm. And um, the atmosphere in this country yeah. was exactly how you describe it. It was um, people started reporting on, on their neighbors. Um, and, you know, um, I remember writing about this one Pakistani family that was reported because um, they were making a curry in the backyard. Mm. And, uh, and the smell had... Re uh, sort of invoked this fear from neighbors who thought it was some kind of toxin. Mm. It would turn out that they were making a lot of curry for a wedding, mm. and and it turned and and they and they were raided because of this. So this fear was not new. Mm. This fear, uh, Trump may be the uh, the current result of this accumulated fear, but the fear had been around since uh, those towers came down, and we hadn't been the same since then. But but I made a point then, and I it's been. A while, so I don't remember exactly how I said it. But um, I always talk about I, how contradictory this country can be, mm -hmm. and usually I have a dollar bill to show you because there is this ego that clutches uh, on one tower on the um, uh, you know arrow, the cl cluster of arrow, but on the other is um, what is that that olive branch, uh, you know, uh, of peace. And to me, had, oh, that had always represented the kind of contradiction of this empire, because one is this necessity of you know, resources and power and dominance mm -hmm. over the world, but then there is the ideal in which you and I can sit mm -hmm. in front of a crowd yeah. and talking about what America means. And so, in a way, you hold this contradiction in your head as you maybe mourning the, the, the shift in the, the ether, mm -hmm. but the ideal is what we fight for. The mm -hmm. ideal is what we want to render true, even as we accept that the reality is the turning dark, right? And maybe the battle never ends because the, the, the bird doesn't let go either one, but mm -hmm. I think if we put our strength and our energy and our creativity toward rendering that ideal world, mm -hmm. Um, however you interpret that, mm -hmm. is it, something that uh, the role of artists can do. Yeah, but the ideal preserves the, the recurrence of this kind of thing, these kind of hiccups, mm -hmm. historic interruptions, the return of the dark, right? And I think as a creative writer, I always resist. Um, even the belief in the ideal was necessitated by existential kind of realities, right? Namely, the, the threat of war, of displacement of poverty. And maybe Trump is a wake up call that no matter uh, the nation and its civil rights and its laws, the nation is a cancer in the sense, and its ideology in particular, it's mm -hmm. always reversible. And so that was one of the questions I wanted to ask. Um, it, we, we are quick to celebrate the American, right? The, the, the projected American, its ideal. But perhaps that's also the, the thing to which we're addicted, that kind of may, make us susceptible to these kind of betrayals, right? Perhaps as creative writers, we need to find a language that always keeps the ideology at arm's length, that doesn't necessarily evoke it or subsume it or try to celebrate it too much. Because the disappointment is, is a lot, and it's not But just it's in, part of yeah. life, the disappointment. Yeah, right? You can't yeah. not have that. It's yeah. to have this thing that I think you're talking about is to constantly remain cynical. Yeah. And I am not the most hopeful person on this panel, I can <laughs> tell you right now. Um, I am a pessimist and perfectly happy mm -hmm. as one. <laughs> but this notion yeah. that you can't, the, I, America is a, is a false dream in many ways and built on the backs of slaves after a complete demolishing of an entire continent of people, of mm -hmm. course it's not gonna mm -hmm. pan out. These are not historical hiccups. This mm -hmm. is a toxin that is gonna yeah. sail through forever in this country's mm -hmm. history.
pessimism aside. But we are on this panel together, and we are all, um, you know, dressed and fed and safe for the most part. And that, and we have this ability to tell stories without being put in prison, right. which yeah. is huge. Which is yeah. not true of anybody that I know with creative license in Iran. Right. Yeah. You know, the filmmakers who I admire, who go forth to make these beautiful testaments, who have to use children as their mm -hmm. protagonists because they cannot use adults because of the regime, they are constantly on house arrest. Mm -hmm. They have to live in exile. Mm -hmm. So here we are with these abilities to tell these stories, which I you know, honor and respect, until we cannot, and then my mm -hmm. pessimism will come back. The <laughs> thing that I think is very interesting about what you said, though, that is you know, call to arms for everybody, but especially the storyteller, is now that... Trump has introduced this non-truth, mm. this constant language of fluid reality, basically the doublespeak of mm -hmm. Orwell. Mm -hmm. In that empty space where there is nothing stable, the storyteller has to step in and lay the groundwork for, for how, we, no, how we are going to talk to each other. Right. And so I have not been able to write because for many reasons, but one <laughs> of them is that Okay, I am a storyteller, and all I want to do is tell the story that's going to get the Trump voter to turn into a puddle. If they read it, that is. I'm just saying. My optimism will step in now. If they read. Say they read. Or, you know, <laughs> watch TV. I'll make a TV show or whatever medium I have to go yeah. to. But this idea that, like, I cannot keep writing for, you know, the liberal um, Caucasian female book group. Mm. which I do love because they have paid all my bills for the last 10 years. <laughs> but I need, like, the storyteller, that space yeah. where Trump has decimated fact, yeah. Yeah. we do have to step in and we have to be like, okay, we've always thought fact was garbage, and now here is this other kind of poetic truth. But how am I going to get you, Trump supporter, to listen to me, who, like, you know, enemy, you know, axis of evil, whatever they're calling us now, mm. sanctiony people, um, like... That is the challenge, and it's such a big thing to carry. Yeah. But it does, as a writer, as a creative person, it's like the challenge. Yeah. Like, how are you going to tell that beautiful story? Like Shahrazad, she like told that story that saved her life every night, yeah. every night, over and over again. And it's gonna, if it comes to that, I gotta like go and like sharpen my storytelling skills <laughs> to be like, when you come to deport me with my passport, <laughs> you know, like I have a story. Um, that's, that's like the, the pessimism washes aside and the art steps in. Isn't it strange? I'm the youngest member of this panel. Mm -hmm. I'm the most pessimistic yeah. as you characterized it. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> I guess, you know, it's, maybe it's the Catholic in me. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a lame motif, guys, for the whole conversation. Yeah, I, I guess it's, I'm just, for all the kind of darkness that kind of uh, shades my response, uh, I'm speaking tradition of Beckett, right? Uh, this kind of recognition of, uh, of, 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 of the radical, not meaninglessness, but in the radical instability or state of precarity that we all live in. But Beckett was a humorist. Oh, yeah, of course. You know, so well, at the end can, of all of it, it was yeah, absurd. You can, cr you can laugh with tears, that's fine, yeah. right? But there's a sense in which the ideal can sometimes uh, soften the rough edges of existential kind of chaos. And that is what I'm resisting, because perhaps if we don't try too hard to belong, meaning we don't uh, let the optimism of the ideal of the host country uh, subsume the rough edges of our uh, experiences, our past, of our attempt to belong, perhaps that might be a more honest or enterprise, as opposed to trying to kind of soften and beautify the ugliness of it all. I feel like I don't see that in fiction sometimes. It's, it's, it's an ugliness that is well articulated, uh, that is not inflected in the form, in the language. And maybe we should kind of go back to the modernness and go to the level of the materiality of speech itself, right? The, the materiality of the grammar. And so language itself has to be called into question, right? Grammar itself has to be questioned and its capacity. To, because our duty is not so much to tell our stories beautifully, but also uh, to evoke our sufferings without any blemish, without any kind of like, you know, sublimation, an easy one that is. So that's my interest. And of course, it's all pessimistic, but I think it's a big part. <laughs> it's, I think it's, it's an element of the attempt to relate. Because sometimes I think like, Americans don't even get it. Like, 
what it takes to come here. Right. No, they don't. they don't. And so that's part of the calculus, right? That we have to engender somehow. But you know, I, I would say that I, I don't write with such a big audience in mind. I, mm. I write because it's like a story that, like I was telling my sister and my cousin the other day, it's like I had to dream mm. and this family was making their way to see um, the sea uh, at the end of Lens End. Mm. And they live in Oakland, but they don't know their way there because they're mm. poor. And, and this dream was nagging at me and I didn't know why until mm. I had to write it. I don't think intellectually. Mm. I mean, unfortunately, that's not what I do when I create a story. Mm. I create a story because it speaks to me uh, on a, a visceral level. And when it does, it, it, it carries its own weight, its own demand. Mm. Um, the intellectual idea may come along at some third draft and fourth draft when I might say something like about our current situation, but it's, it's always the story. And whether it's good, it makes you weep, it makes you say aha about the human condition, that never changes. Mm -hmm. it, but you can, of course, you know, cater it to the contemporary time if you want to, to say something about mm -hmm. our time. But the skeleton of the yeah. story, the suffering, it's as old as your Adam and Eve in the fall, right? Because if you write about refugees, when didn't Adam and Eve lose a house and run away from yeah. The first country or something. Uh, they didn't run, they got pushed out. They got pushed out, yeah, they got exiled from the first house, right? It was a big tree. Um, so, uh, With you know, a snake, is there a neighbor? Yes. So, so, I mean, stories are as old as time, right? It just, it's, it has to be good, it has to last, yeah. you know? And I would say one more thing is that, that one of my, you know, years ago, Robert Olin Butler wrote this book called Strange Scent of the Mountain, which I am purely mm -hmm. surprised, and from it's the beautiful. point of view of Vietnamese. Mm. And then people ask me, like, how do you feel about that? And I say, well, you know, as long as he gets away with it, if it's good, it gets away with it, right? And some of the stories did, but not all. Anyway, uh, um, and I wrote a short story in Birds of Paradise House in which it was a white kid who talks about this refugee kid comes in, instead of from the point of view of the refugee kid, I got the white kid to talk about the stranger into his classroom. And I thought it was one of the most successful pieces I ever wrote because it freed me to say something. And what's so fascinating about that piece was that it was used in the post-war literature uh, format in, at uh, Tufts University in New Orleans. And this one um, grad student who was studying to be a, te a teacher wrote me and said, uh, I, after I read your short story, I." went out to the backyard and I wept. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I was growing up really poor. And this kid who came in and he smelled and he was even poorer than me, so I bullied him. Mm -hmm. And now I read your short story, I hadn't thought about it, but I need to find him to apologize. Mm -hmm. So I shared it with the professor who was teaching that class. And he said, congratulations, mm -hmm. your short story made the bully cry. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what, maybe that's what it should be for, mm -hmm. rather than like this larger idea that I'm fighting for America. Right. This bully finally cried for the Vietnamese kid. I think it accomplished something, and maybe I'm modest that way, mm -hmm. but that's enough for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point. And uh, another point which is related is that the minute fiction becomes preachy, mm -hmm. readers withdraw. Right. And um, I've noticed this tendency in myself. I just gave a reader something to read, and she was telling me she liked X, Y, and Z. But then there was this one preachy part, which I felt was preachy when I was writing it, but I really wanted to make that point. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and that's not what makes literature, that's yeah. literature you want to read. So I think it's a, it's a really tricky position to be in if you want your work to be read in the future, and also if you want your work to be resonant uh, the way you were describing to all kinds of people. Uh, but it does require excising uh, that preachy stuff. I think we have room for one more question, and that's it. Hey, I think that No? No? Someone raised their hand. Raise your hand. Who wanted, who I thought someone raised their hand. Sorry. Oh. 
Just I scratching. do that to my students all the time. <laughs> Pick them. <laughs> then they have to say something. Well, I think that. Um, I actually have a question. Okay. If Conveniently. That's a question. <laughs> um, so then, like, what do you kind of see for yourselves as um, artists and um, thinkers and global citizens in the next four years? What do you kind of see that being like at the end of this term? Mm -hmm. um, where do you kind of see yourself if that's a relevant question to you and your work? I'll jump in. Uh, the thing I've been saying to myself a lot lately is do a little more. <laughs> uh, and what I mean by that is this. I feel, I feel that we, many of us, got kind of comfortable under the Obama administration, but we're not in a state of comfort anymore. And so it does require, I think, doing a little more, whether it's with our own work in what we address and how we address it, or whether it's other things. So for my part, I took training yesterday to become a union steward at my college. Wow. Uh, thank you. So, do I have time for this? No. <laughs> Am I really eager to work on grievances at my college and know the contract back and forth? Well, but here's the thing. Uh, organizing at the grassroots level at a college is a powerful thing to do. We just, rat we just got our first contract and it's gone into effect in July. Uh, but a union isn't strong and we aren't strong until we organize. So I feel like doing that, although perhaps it seems unrelated to storytelling or unrelated to writing, actually it is part of, of this feeling of wanting to do more, even if it's not convenient for me, even if it's time consuming for me, so I can contribute to this, this bigger question in this period. I'm gonna have a slightly weak answer to this because the, the four years is such an overwhelming prospect and I'm spending all of my energy um, trying to pacify North Korea. Um, <laughs> so, you know, my karmic energy is all headed in that direction to just calm everybody down <laughs> as much as possible. So barring that, um, yeah, this, so the one hopeful thing that happened in the last election, on election night, was that um, my parents, as well as many Iranians, many Vietnamese, many Chinese, many Africans who just came to this country, um, many South Americans, live in Orange County. Um, my parents moved there when I was in college, so I've never lived there, but I've visited a lot. And in this last election, it was the first county in the entirety of the United States to switch from traditionally Republican to Democrat. Yeah. They were the only county to go the other way. And the reasoning for this was that in the last 30 slash 40 years, the immigrant influx has been so intense that many of my brother's white friends have moved to Arizona. And <laughs> like the neighborhoods are just filling with immigrants from all over the world of every socioeconomic range. But largely middle class and wealthy, which is a testament to the sort of, you know, money talks and bullshit walks kind of idea in this country. And so they have managed to swing the voting in that county to what favors them and what favors a kind of pluralism that I think was perhaps our dream intention for this country. Not the intention of the founders who were slave owners, but the intentions <laughs> of us sitting in this room is that we dream of this pluralism and Orange County represents it. And I think if there's a way in the next four years or in the next two years even to help empower immigrant voices, either through my students or through my work or through workshops, and to try to get that conversation started and maintained, then I will feel like when the ship sinks, I didn't do nothing nothing like I did do something um, so so the um, the website new America media that I um, co-edit is really dedicated to uh, immigrant rights and um, and the new thing that we have added on is coverage of hate crimes and the rising of hate incidents mm. um, so as a journalist I've 
I constantly have to fill my social duties, mm. duties, and um, so I never have worry about that. As a, but I've never seen that as an art, artistic part of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm working on another book of short stories and a novel, and that to me is the the larger perspective of um, our time and mm -hmm. looking at um, kind of homeless kid who. Shanghai himself across five different countries just to find his place in the world. Um, and to me, that speaks closest to my own identity. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is that social duty, you know, um, getting uh, people to write about hate crimes and in their communities and stuff. So that's, that's the hat that I put on every mm -hmm. day uh, when I go to work. Um, but in terms of uh, what moves me in, in the world of art and dreams, it's, uh, it's very personal. But of course, you know, you bring your full humanity mm -hmm. to bear. Mm -hmm. So I have all the confidence that it will reflect our time. Mm -hmm. I think I'll be editing a journal um, that is devoted to writing by immigrant and refugee authors. Uh, I want to recognize David and Ellen. Can you guys stand up, please? Because they are doing good work. Uh, So we have a new journal uh, called The Bear Life Review, and our first issue will be in spring, but I think for the foreseeable future, that what we're going to be doing, that's what I'm going to be doing, and then of course working on you know, this endless project. I've been working on for five years, a novel, <laughs> uh, maybe five more years, one heart. Uh, <laughs> maybe then I would have learned what to say, because mm. I don't know yet. Uh, yeah, so that's the, but four years is a long time. It's not also a lot of time. Right creatively speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the trajectory of the next few years. Uh, I think we, Done. we're good. Yeah. I'm sneaking up behind <laughs> you to say thank you for the most amazing panel tonight. I was in tears a couple times. I want to thank our panelists. <laughs> our moderator, Noel, Andrew, Anita, and Lale. I also want to thank uh, the San Francisco Public Library for letting us do this here free of charge for you people. It's a wonderful cultural and literary exchange. Uh, and uh, to the Litquake staff and to everybody who had anything to do with tonight, thank you so much. Uh, you, if you want to see it again, it'll be on the San Francisco Main Library's channel on YouTube. Uh, tell your friends, because I just think this was a, a fantastic evening. And thank you all for, oh, and Luis Herrera, bless you. Thank you so much for letting us be here. Thank you for coming. <laughs>